You've heard of Rembrandt, you've heard of Van Gogh, but have you heard of Vermeer and the controversy surrounding him? Johannes, also known as Jan Vermeer, is considered one of the greatest painters of the Dutch Golden Age alongside Rembrandt. He specialized in domestic interior scenes of middle to upper class life. Vermeer was born in Delft, the Netherlands in 1632 and he died in 1675 at the young age of 43. It's believed he produced less than 50 paintings in his lifetime and approximately 36 of them have survived. Several of his paintings were purchased by a wealthy Delft resident which helped Vermeer stay afloat economically, unlike most Dutch painters who were just trying to make ends meet. However, Vermeer mostly made his living as an art dealer and he died in debt after the Franco-Dutch War ruined the Dutch economy, leaving behind his wife and 11 children. Right after his death, his wife sold three of his paintings to the local baker so the family could afford bread. Vermeer's paintings featured specific attributes, especially the way he utilized light to illuminate certain parts of the painting. These attributes also include the use of yellow and blue tones, the depiction of women, the use of wall coverings like maps and artworks, the use of domestic tools, heavy drapery, as well as specific facial expressions and objects that tell a story. This allowed Vermeer to realistically depict Dutch women and their values. Art historians didn't pay much attention to Vermeer during the first two centuries after his death. His work wasn't rediscovered until 1842 when a French art critic first saw Vermeer's painting View of Delft in the Netherlands and wanted to know more about Vermeer and his work. The rediscovery continued in 1860 when a German museum director recognized one of Vermeer's works that was attributed to another artist. How popular is Vermeer today? We were fortunate enough to get tickets to see the sold out four month long Vermeer exhibition at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, which featured 28 of his paintings, the most ever shown in one place. While the Rijksmuseum regularly features a few select Vermeers, many were on loan from museums in Paris, London, New York, Washington DC, The Hague, Tokyo, Edinburgh, Dresden, Berlin, Frankfurt, and Dublin. Over 650,000 people from 113 countries attended the exhibition, making it the most visited exhibition in the history of the Rijksmuseum. We were only able to get tickets because the Rijksmuseum added evening tickets. So after visiting the Rijksmuseum at 9 a.m. to see masterpieces from other artists, we came back at 9 o'clock that evening to see the Vermeer exhibition. The first four paintings we see are large paintings and are believed to be among his earliest works. He was in his early 20s at the time and was just becoming known as a master painter. These works all had a religious theme as Vermeer was born a reformed Protestant and converted to Catholicism when he married a Catholic woman. He wanted to excel in history painting at the time. Christ in the House of Mary and Martha is one of Vermeer's earliest paintings and relies on a Flemish model and painting style as well as influences from Italian artists. It's Vermeer's largest painting and his only known work of a biblical subject, pointing to the fact that it was probably a painting that was commissioned. In the painting, this New Testament story tells of Christ's visit to the house of two sisters, Mary and Martha, who welcomed the traveling Christ to their home. Martha serves him bread, a reference to the Last Supper. Christ praised Mary's efforts to sit and listen to his teachings, unlike Martha, who was preoccupied with housekeeping. Martha noticed that Mary is at the feet of Christ, listening to him and not helping her with the work. Martha complains to Jesus about this, and Jesus acknowledges the many things that need to be done, but he tells her that she is too preoccupied with them and she should focus on him, their guest. The underlying message is that Mary's contemplation is much more important than the material world that preoccupies Martha. By pointing to Mary, Christ indicates his belief that she is choosing the righteous path. The room is dark, which highlights the three main figures who are friends. The light brings them into focus. The space between them is a white triangle, which invites us into the painting. We also see that instead of using lines and outlines to define shapes in his painting, Vermeer places different blocks of color next to each other. Mary's profile is created by the silhouette of her skin against the brightly lit tablecloth behind her. Jesus has a subtle halo around his head. The folds and fabrics, such as Christ's robe, are also built up using light and dark elements. This creates a subtle play of light and shadow, which is also characteristic of Vermeer's later work. 
When the painting came to light in the late 19th century, it was not immediately attributed to Vermeer. It was only when the work was cleaned in 1901 that Vermeer's signature was discovered on the stool that Mary is sitting on. The scholars then realized that another painting could officially be added to Vermeer's repertoire. St. Praxatis According to legend, St. Praxatis was a second century daughter of a disciple of St. Paul living in Rome, revered for having cared for the bodies of Christians who died under religious persecution. The painting shows the saint squeezing a martyr's blood from a sponge into a vessel, which Vermeer paints in great detail. A slain man is lying behind her, his head detached from his bleeding body. Her sister Pudenciana, who is a traditional Christian saint and martyress, walks on the right side of the painting into a temple. Vermeer converted to Catholicism just two years before this was painted, and many art historians have seen St. Praxatis as an expression of the artist's devotion to his new faith. St. Praxatis is closely related to a work by Florentine artist Felici Ficarelli from 1640 to 1645. The most obvious difference between the two is that there was no crucifix in the Ficarelli painting. It is Vermeer's only known close copy of another work. This painting has two signatures and is dated by Vermeer. For a long time, it was unclear whether or not Vermeer was the artist for this painting. In 2014, the auction house Christie's announced the results of a new analysis, which in their opinion, demonstrated it conclusively to be a Vermeer. The painting sold for $10.7 million. For the Vermeer exhibition, the Rijksmuseum conducted an investigation and it too concluded it is painted by Vermeer. Diana and her nymphs, also known as Diana and her companions, is a Vermeer painting about a mythological subject. Vermeer is best known as a painter of tranquil interiors. However, early in his career, he did paint some mythological scenes, including Diana and her nymphs. Diana was the goddess of the moon and the hunt, which explains the crescent moon symbol on her forehead and the hound at her feet. She is also a model of chastity. Diana plays a role in various mythological tales which were the subject of numerous narratives by Dutch Golden Age painters. Vermeer chose not to paint a scene from a specific tale about Diana, instead choosing to depict her together with her nymphs in natural surroundings where they are resting after a hunt. Specifically, Diana and her nymphs are at her toilette. The theme of a woman in a private reflective moment would grow stronger in Vermeer's paintings as his career progressed. Diana wears a loose-fitting yellow dress with an animal skin sash and on her head, a headband with a symbol of the crescent moon. As she sits on a rock, a nymph washes her left foot. Another, behind Diana, sits with her partially bare back to the viewer, which is the most skin Vermeer shows on a figure in any of his surviving paintings. A third nymph, sitting at Diana's left, holds her own left foot with her right hand. A fourth stands in the rear, somewhat apart from the rest of the group, facing them and the viewer at an angle, her eyes cast down, her fists covering her stomach, perhaps suggesting she is pregnant. Callista was a follower of Diana, and legend has it that she became pregnant, and either the wife of Zeus or Diana herself transformed her into a bear as punishment. A dog sits in the lower left corner near Diana, its back to the viewer, as it faces the goddess, her attendants, and immediately in front of it, a thistle, which grows in front of the stone upon which Diana is seated. Thistles were traditionally considered to be a love herb that could arouse desire. The plant may symbolize the temptations of the flesh that Diana and her nymphs try to resist. Except for the woman whose face is completely turned away from the viewer, all of the other faces in the painting are to one degree or another in shadow, including that of the dog, but the copper plate in the foreground gleams in the light. None of the women look at each other, each seemingly absorbed in their own thoughts, a fact which contributes to the solemn mood of the piece. The painting Salamut is unusual for a scene depicting the goddess Diana. In 1999-2000, when the painting underwent restoration work and was cleaned, it was discovered that an area of blue sky in the upper right corner had been added in the 19th century. When Diana and her nymphs was acquired for the Moritz House Museum in 1876, it was accredited to a student of Rembrandt. In 1885, it was discovered that a monogram in the painting had been forged. An original Vermeer signature was hidden underneath. The painting was subsequently attributed to Johannes Vermeer, who was still relatively unknown at the time. The Procurus is Vermeer's first genre painting and shows a scene of contemporary life, 
an image of mercenary love perhaps in a brothel. The scene consists of four almost life-size figures. The woman in black is the procuress, a woman who is the intermediary between a prostitute and a man willing to pay for her services. The man to her right, a musician holding a string instrument and wearing a black beret and a close-fitting jacket with slit sleeves, has been identified as a self-portrait of Vermeer. The man in the red jacket, a soldier, is fondling the young woman's breast and dropping a coin into her outstretched hand. The woman is dressed conservatively and has a sunny, cheerful face, so the last thing you would expect is that she is a prostitute. Vermeer was inspired to paint this painting by another version of the Procurus, a copy of which his mother-in-law owned. Vermeer's father owned an inn where this type of behavior could have taken place. Vermeer was most likely inspired to paint a procuring scene on a large scale by a group who followed the 16th century Italian artist Caravaggio. The theme of loose society, depicted through light and dark, was typical of this group of artists. Right in the center of the composition, Vermeer depicts the moment of payment, the handover of the coin into the girl's hand. An x-ray image of the painting shows that the coin was already in the girl's hand in an earlier version. With this correction, Vermeer added some tension with the impending transfer of money. By introducing a tall carpet-covered balustrade, Vermeer divided the image into two nearly equal parts. The two darkly shaded figures on the left contrast with the bright yellow, white, and red of the pair on the right, as well as the colorful carpet. They create a vertical division in the painting. The figure of the young girl in the bright yellow jacket and white lace trim headscarf attracts the attention of both the suitor and the viewer. The restoration of the painting from 2002 to 2004 revealed the original vibrancy of the jacket that was painted in lead tin yellow and repeatedly altered during the painting process. As he has often done when painting household objects, the blue and white Westerwald jug and the Roman glass on the small table behind the balustrade are both painted with great attention to detail by Vermeer. Girl reading a letter at an open window, also known as lady reading at an open window. The painting depicts a young Dutch blonde girl standing at an open window reading a letter. A red drapery hangs over the top of the window glass. The window is open and reflects the girl in the lower right section of the glass. However, the reflection of the girl on the window pane gives us a different view of the girl's face, as the reflection is not what we as the viewer are seeing. The angle of the head and the hairstyle are different. A tasseled, partially closed drapery in the foreground hides a quarter of the room in which she stands, but it is drawn back enough to reveal the scene to the viewer. The color of the drape reflects the green of the woman's gown. We also see the fruit tilted in a bowl on the red drape table. On the table besides the bowl, a peach is cut in half with the pit on top. The rug covered table with the bowl of fruit on it separates the viewer from the woman. In 2000, art history professor and author Norbert Schneider wrote that the open window represents, quote, the woman's longing to extend her domestic sphere, end quote, beyond the constraints of her home and society, while the fruit, quote, is a symbol of extramarital relations, end quote. Schneider concludes that the letter is a love letter, either planning or continuing her taboo relationship. This painting, An Officer and Laughing Girl, which we'll see next, represent the earliest known examples of the pointillé, globular dots of light tone paint for which Vermeer became known. Vermeer produced transparent colors by applying paint onto the canvas in granular layers. Time Magazine art critic Robert Hughes wrote about his technique, quote, Vermeer had developed a unique way of rendering light and texture. Instead of building up forms with continuous movements of the brush, he used tiny luminous highlights, pasty dots, and spots bringing more dissolved areas of light into focus. These gave a startling effect of studied textural distinctiveness. It's as though you can see every crumb in a cut loaf, every thread in a tapestry, end quote. Girl reading a letter at an open window was among the paintings rescued from destruction during the bombing of Dresden in World War II. The painting was stored with other works of art in a tunnel in Saxony. When the Red Army found them, they took them. The Soviets portrayed this as an act of rescue, while others thought it was an act of theft. Either way, after the death of Joseph Stalin, the Soviets returned the art to Germany in 1955. In 2017, tests revealed that the painting had been altered after the painter's death. A 2019 restoration reveals that Cupid is on the wall behind the girl, 
indicating this painting may be about true love. The covering of Cupid was not done by Vermeer. And now let's talk about the controversy surrounding Johannes Vermeer. Many of his paintings, including this one, have the characteristics of a photograph rather than a painting, as some of his paintings have very realistic light patterns that would be hard to reproduce with the naked eye. Certain objects are painted slightly out of focus like you would see through an optical lens. Vermeer got the color values right in a way the human eye can't see. Some art historians say that Vermeer used an optical device called the camera obscura. A camera obscura consists of a box, tent, or room with a small hole in one side or the top. Light from an external scene passes through the hole and strikes the surface inside where the scene is reproduced on a canvas or piece of paper, upside down and reversed left to right, but with color and perspective preserved. The artist could then sketch or trace the outline of the scene. Some say this would have given Vermeer an aid, an unfair advantage, while others have gone further and said it's cheating. If Vermeer was using a camera obscura, he wouldn't be the first. Dutch painters were using the camera obscura before Vermeer's time. On one hand, when Vermeer died, there was no camera obscura in his possession, x-rays of his paintings do not show any evidence of tracing, and no preparatory sketches or works were found. On the other hand, besides the photographic look of his paintings, his good friend Anton van Leeuwenhoek was a microbiologist and built microscopes, so he was an expert on optical lenses. Vermeer could have easily gotten a camera obscura from him. This controversy may never be settled, but if you want more information, I would recommend watching a fascinating documentary called Tim's Vermeer. Regarding this particular painting, the pigment analysis has shown that Vermeer's choice of painting materials did not reveal any peculiarities as he used the usual pigments of the Baroque period. The green drapery in the foreground is painted mainly in a mixture of blue azurite and lead tin yellow, while the lower part contains green earth. For the red drapery in the window and the red parts of the table covering, Vermeer used a mixture of vermilion, matter lake, and lead white. So while it's possible he used a camera obscura for this particular painting, there is no proof one way or the other. Officer and Laughing Girl, which was once attributed to a different artist, includes many of the characteristics of Vermeer's style. The main subject is a woman in a yellow dress. Light is coming from the left-hand side of the painting from an open window, and there is a large map on the wall. Each of these elements occur in some of his other paintings, although this painting differs slightly with the man also sitting at the table. Art historians, who have suggested conflicting interpretations of the work, believe that a painting by another artist inspired this one, and that Vermeer may have used a camera obscura to create the perspective in this painting. The main subject is the woman at the center, whose face is lit by soft, direct light. She resembles Vermeer's wife, Katharina, who is believed to have posed for many of his paintings. With x-ray photographs, Art historians have determined that Vermeer had originally planned to paint the woman with a large white collar, which would have hidden much of her yellow dress. Also, her cap was later extended to cover all of her hair, drawing more attention to her face and expression. This yellow upper part of the dress has appeared in many of Vermeer's other portraits. It's usually worn as an everyday common dress. Over her dress, the woman wears a blue apron, mostly hidden in the shadows of the table. Blue aprons were common at that time, because they hid stains well. Art historians have interpreted this to mean that the soldier has surprised the girl with an impromptu visit during her morning chores. The woman holds a wine glass, usually used for white wine. Because at that time wine costs more than beer, it indicates her wealth. The gentleman wears a red coat and expensive hat, displaying his wealth and rank. His hat is wide-brimmed and made of beaver pelt, which was good for snowy and rainy conditions. The pelts for these hats were imported from the New World, in this case probably from New Netherland, present-day eastern United States, which was at the time controlled by the Dutch West India Company. The red in his uniform is associated with power and passion. His rank as an officer is indicated by the black sash he wears. His undeniable presence in the immediate foreground brings drama and depth to the mood of the composition. This artistic device, in which an object is placed in the foreground, to increase the depth of field of the overall painting is called a repressoire. The relationship between the woman and the soldier is unclear. Many art historians believe that it only portrays a woman being innocently and honorably courted by this soldier. 
However, some have suggested that her open hand and smile could indicate a discreet willingness to engage in sex. Vermeer shows us different forms of light to illustrate certain aspects of the painting. Only bright light comes in from the window and no outside scene can be observed as Vermeer never allows the viewer to see the outside world. The shadows are thinly painted while the highlights are formed with thick dabs of pigment. He may have used a camera obscura in this painting to show him what the relative size of the people should be. The two figures sit very close across the corner of the table, but the image of the officer's head is about twice as wide as that of the smiling girl. We are quite familiar today with foreground objects appearing very large in photos, but in 17th century painting, this is rather unusual. And Vermeer's peers would have made human figures in this type of composition much more nearly equal in size. It's believed that Vermeer made three paintings of his hometown, Delft, and two survive, View of Delft, which we'll see later, and The Little Street. Here Vermeer presents a serene world where time seems to stand still. This is an unusual painting for its time as it focused on ordinary houses. The painting, showing a quiet street, depicts typical life in a Dutch golden age town. It features two women doing mundane tasks and two children playing. The house on the right is believed to belong to his widowed aunt, so he would have known the house well. He signed the painting in the white box on the bottom left. Vermeer was very meticulous in capturing the details of the worn bricks, the leaded windows, and the white plastered wall. In some places the paint is smooth, in others it's grainy. In some places the paint is thick, in some places it's thin. The walls, stones, and brickwork are painted in a thicker paint layer, making them more realistic. Vermeer achieved a realistic depiction of the surfaces with his masterful application of a relatively limited number of pigments. He employed red ochre and matter lake for the reddish brown brick wall, the blue in the sky contains lead white and natural ultramarine, and the green shutters and foliage are painted with azurite mixed with lead tin yellow. Straight angles alternate with the triangle of the house and of the sky, giving the composition a certain strength. Modern x-ray tests prove that Vermeer had intended to add the standing figure of a girl to the right of the open alleyway, but subsequently erased her so as not to upset the peacefulness and equilibrium of the composition. The street looks real, but some experts think it could be imaginary. However, some have said that the site is the Vlamingstraat, a street with a narrow canal, at present day numbers 40 and 42. The Milkmaid, also known as the Kitchen Maid, is one of Vermeer's most famous and most analyzed paintings and is one of the main attractions at the Rijksmuseum. Unlike many of Vermeer's paintings, where he features an affluent young woman, this painting shows not a milkmaid, but a domestic kitchen maid in a plain room, carefully pouring milk into an earthenware container on a table. Also on the table in front of the milkmaid are various types of thick bread, which could be used to make bread pudding. She is a young, sturdily built woman wearing a linen cap a blue apron, and work sleeves pushed up from thick forearms. Given that Vermeer could not afford to hire a model, it's likely that this is one of his maids. A foot warmer is on the floor behind her. Intense light streams from the window on the left side of the canvas. Except for the milk, everything else is still. The stove on the bottom right is where a woman would warm herself by hanging her skirts over it. The stove was seen as symbolizing the burning desire for love and fidelity. On the tiles just behind the stove is an image of Cupid, which may point to the milkmaid's dedication to caring for others and not romantic love. Vermeer has brought the food to life by using sunlight to highlight the objects. He uses small brush strokes and little bright color dots to paint the areas illuminated by the sun. Even minor details like the nail holes in the wall, the nail with shadow, and the broken window pane have all been carefully reproduced. Our eyes fixate on the kitchen maid because there is not much to look at on the bare wall. Karen Rosenberg, an art critic for the New York Times wrote, quote, the light, though bright, doesn't wash out the rough texture of the bread crusts or flatten the volumes of the maid's thick waist and rounded shoulders, end quote. Quote, it's a little bit of a Mona Lisa effect, end quote, in modern viewers' reactions to the painting, according to Walter Lietke, former curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and organizer of two Vermeer exhibits. Quote, there's a bit of mystery about her from modern audiences. She is going about her daily task, faintly smiling, and her reaction is, what is she thinking? End quote. By depicting the working maid cooking, the artist presents not just a picture of an everyday scene, 
but one with ethical and social value. The humble woman is using common ingredients and otherwise useless stale bread to create a pleasurable product for the household. Quote, her measured demeanor, modest dress, and judiciousness in preparing her food conveys eloquently yet unobtrusively one of the strongest values of 17th century Netherlands, domestic virtue, end quote, according to the Essential Vermeer website. According to the Rijksmuseum, the painting, quote, is built up along two diagonal lines. They meet by the woman's right wrist, end quote. This focuses the attention of the viewer on the pouring of the milk. According to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the, quote, point to lay pattern of bright dots on the bread and basket are the most effusive use of that scheme in any Vermeer painting, and it appears to be used to suggest scintillating daylight and rough textures at the same time, end quote. Vermeer painted over two items originally in the painting, a large wall map behind the upper part of the woman's body and a large closer sewing basket near the bottom of the painting, behind the maid's red skirt, which was discovered with an x-ray. Other Vermeer paintings also have images removed. Some art critics have thought the removals may have been intended to provide the works with better thematic focus. According to Raquel Lanieri from Forbes magazine, quote, there is a tactile visceral quality to the milkmaid. You can almost taste the thick creamy milk escaping the jug, feel the cool dampness of the room and the starchy linen of the maid's white cap, touch her sculptural shoulders and corseted waist. She is not an apparition or abstraction. She is not the ideal worldly housewife of Vermeer's later young woman with a water pitcher or the ethereal beauty and girl with a pearl earring. She is not the cartoonish buxom vixen in Leiden's painting. She is real, as real as a painting can get anyway, end quote. The woman's coarse features are painted with thick dabs of impasto, which is a technique used in painting, where paint is laid on an area of the surface thickly, usually thick enough that the brush or painting strokes are visible. Paint can also be mixed right on the canvas. When dry, impasto provides texture. The paint appears to be coming out of the canvas. The woman's bulky green oversleeves were painted with the same yellow and blue paint used in the rest of the woman's clothing. Broad strokes in the painting of the clothing suggest the thick texture of the work clothing. The blue cuff uses a lighter mixture of ultramarine and lead white, together with a layer of ochre painted beneath it. The brilliant blue of the skirt or apron has been intensified with a glaze, a thin transparent top layer of the same color. The seeds on the crust of the bread, as well as the crust itself, along with the handles of the bread basket, are rendered with point delay dots. Soft parts of the bread are rendered with thin swirls of paint with dabs of ochre used to show the rough edges of the broken crust. One piece of bread to the viewer's right has a broad band of yellow, different from the crust, which could mean that the piece is going stale. The discrepancy between objects at various distances from the viewer may indicate Vermeer used a camera obscura. The image seems to become softer and more diffuse as the eye moves away from the back and towards the objects in the foreground. Vermeer would create, quote, circles of confusion, end quote, which are highlight circles showing an image slightly out of focus, like a camera would create, but the naked eye would not naturally see things in that manner. Daniel Fink tells us, quote, painters who do not base their images on an optical system create highlights according to the way their eyes perceive these highlights, end quote. These circles of confusion are not part of the way our eye perceives reality because of how quickly our eyes can change focus much more quickly than a camera lens can. Walter Lika pointed out that a pinhole discovered in the canvas, quote, has really punctured the theory of the camera obscura. The idea that Vermeer traced compositions in an optical device is rather naive when you consider that the light lasts maybe 10 seconds, but the painting took at least months to paint, end quote. Instead, the pin in the canvas would have been tied to a string with chalk on it, which the painter would have snapped to get perspective lines, Lika said. As I mentioned, The Milkmaid is one of Vermeer's most famous paintings, but there's another one of his most famous paintings that is not here, Girl with a Pearl Earring. It was part of this exhibition as it was on loan from the Mords House Museum collection in The Hague in the Netherlands. Unfortunately, it was returned to the Mords House Museum about two weeks before we attended this exhibition. The glass of wine, also known as the wine glass, is striking due to its use of bright colors throughout. It portrays a seated woman and a standing man drinking in a room. The work contains the characteristics of genre painting of the Delft school 
developed by Peter de Hoog in the late 1650s. It contains figures present in a brightly lit and spacious interior where they are drinking around a table. The figures are set in the middle of the room rather than in the foreground. The stained glass window shows a female figure leaning forward with bridles, which represents moderation, which alludes to the consumption of wine, but also to the dangers of letting oneself get carried away by emotions. The man exudes confidence, showing his dominance in this romance. The seduction of a naive young woman by an older experienced man was a popular topic in Dutch painting. The clothes of the man and woman, the patterned tablecloth, the gold picture frame hanging on the back wall, and the coat of arms in the stained glass window all suggest a wealthy setting. Additionally, the fact that the woman holds the glass of wine at the base indicates she is part of the upper class. The scene likely represents some type of courtship, but the roles being played by the two figures are not clear. The woman has just drained the glass of wine and the man seems impatient to pour her more, almost as if he is trying to get her drunk. A musical instrument, the sit-turn, lies on the chair with musical notebooks. However, the figure of Temperance, depicted in the stained glass window, who is watching over both figures, adds to the tension in the scene. Compared to his earlier paintings, Vermeer's brushwork in the glass of wine is more restrained. While the faces and clothes of the figures are depicted with wide smooth outlines, only in the tapestry of the tablecloth and the window glass did the artist apply finely detailed straight brushstrokes. The glass of wine is a transitional work and is not generally viewed as one of Vermeer's finest. Girl interrupted at her music. In this painting, Vermeer depicts a woman at her music with a gentleman beside her. She stares at us, perhaps because we disturbed her in a private moment. This painting shows a typical courtship during the 17th century in Europe. It also focuses on the importance of music when it comes to love. It's unclear whether he is her music teacher or suitor or both. The room they're in is one of higher class and the man is likely upper class based on his fashionable attire. The wine glass, discreetly shown on the table behind the songbook, represents both joyfulness and seduction. In the 17th century, it was popular to paint scenes that depicted feasts that included drinking, gaming, and playing music. Later on, these large gatherings became smaller and more exclusive with two or three people shown. Drinking wine was also associated with love during this time period. You can see that the glass is full and untouched, which symbolizes the slow-moving relationship between the man and the woman. The chairs in the painting are thought to have been from Spain. They are some of the few objects in the painting that were not damaged by heavy restoration. You can see the minute details, including the lion head carving, the brass studs, and the lozenge pattern that were all popular aspects of furniture during the time. The hazy painting in the background is of Cupid. The painting within a painting was discovered after its restoration in 1907. It had been covered up by a wall and a hanging violin. Several observations have been made about the Cupid painting and its possible symbolism, including that Cupid may be warning the couple about the dangers of love, that Cupid's upraised hand was a symbol that you must only have one lover, that Cupid is holding up a blank card which represents love as a game, or shows that love is in the air. The reason for Vermeer including the miniature Cupid painting may never be revealed due to the painting's damaged condition. On the table sits a vase made of porcelain and silver, likely used for serving wine. One of the main centers for porcelain in the Netherlands was and still is Delft. Love and music often went hand in hand in the 17th century, especially with the presence of a musical duet between a man and a woman. Playing music with one another was one of the few activities where young people of the opposite sex could socialize. The man and woman in the painting were likely very educated when it came to music, and each likely had a personal collection of songbooks. In view of Delft, which was Vermeer's only cityscape, and in fact, is considered by some to be the most famous cityscape of the Dutch 17th century, he does something unexpected by not focusing on the most important buildings in the city. The interplay of light and shade, the impressive cloudy sky, and the subtle reflections in the water make this painting a masterpiece. We are looking at Delft from the south. There is hardly a hint of wind, and the city seems quite tranquil. Vermeer reflected this tranquility in his composition by making three horizontal strips, water, city, and sky. People are of lesser importance in this cityscape. It's because the people are missing in this busy trading town that it seems so quiet and tranquil. 
The edge of the city lies in shadow, but Vermeer tempts us to go into the city center and leads us there with the bright sun. He probably painted the city from his upper floor studio, which was located in a tavern. On the far right is a medieval brick building known as the Rotterdam Gate. On the lower left side of the painting, five people are ready to board a passenger barge. He leads our eye into the distance by his use of light and dark, perspective, color, and texture. A technical analysis shows that Vermeer used calcite, lead white, yellow ochre, natural ultramarine, and matter lake pigments. Originally, there was a man to the right of the two women, but he painted it out. The most important building in Delft was the newer kirk, the new church, on the right, so Vermeer lit up the spire with full sunshine. Vermeer took some liberties with the cityscape. For example, he would paint reflections longer than they were, or the new church spire was actually more to the right in reality. This painting was the one that made Vermeer famous almost two centuries after he painted it. In 1842, a French art critic said the painting was superb and most unusual. He helped establish Vermeer as a master of the Dutch Golden Age. At a glance, the quote, brilliance of the light, the intensity of the color, the solidity of the paint in certain parts, the effect that is both very real and nevertheless original, end quote, reminded him of Rembrandt. However, Rembrandt, who lived and worked in the nearby town of Leiden, was not the artist. The person who made this painting, according to a museum catalog, was somebody named, quote, Jan van der Meer, end quote. Woman holding a balance. In the painting, Vermeer has depicted what discreetly appears to be a young pregnant woman dressed in a blue jacket with a fur trim, holding an empty balance before a table on which stands an open jewelry box containing pearls and gold. She holds the scales to determine the jewel's monetary value. The balance rests in equilibrium, giving the viewer a sense of order and rhythm. A blue cloth is seen in the left foreground beneath a mirror and a window to the left unseen except for its golden curtain, provides soft light, illuminating the scene. Behind the woman is a painting of the Last Judgment, featuring Christ with raised outstretched hands, making it clear that one day, she too will be weighed, that is, judged. The woman's deep introspection causes the viewer momentary hesitation about intruding on this private contemplative moment. At one time the painting was known as Woman Weighing Gold, but closer evaluation has determined that the balance in her hand is empty. Opinions on the theme and symbolism of the painting differ with the woman, who may have been modeled on Vermeer's wife Katerina, viewed either as a symbol of materialism or morality. According to Robert Huerta in Vermeer and Plato painting the ideal, the image has been variously, quote, interpreted as a representation of divine truth or justice, as a religious meditative aid, and as an incitement to lead a balanced, thoughtful life." End quote. Some art critics, including John Michael Montius, who describes her as, quote, symbolically weighing unborn souls, end quote, have seen the woman as a figure of Mary. To some critics who perceive her as measuring her valuables, the juxtaposition with the final judgment suggests that the woman should be focusing on the treasures of heaven rather than those of earth, with the mirror on the wall reinforcing the vanity of her pursuits. Other historians have suggested that the balance represents her careful harmonization of worldly possessions and spiritual piety. In this interpretation, the mirror on the wall reflects the woman's self-knowledge. The first pigment analysis of this painting revealed the use of ultramarine for the blue tablecloth and lead white for the gray wall. The pigment in the bright yellow curtain was identified as Indian yellow. Subsequent technical investigations of the painting have shown that it had been extended by approximately 5 centimeters on every side at a much later date. The proper pigment of the yellow curtain is lead tin yellow. The woman's gaze at the balance, when considered in the context of the last judgment on the wall behind her, suggests that Vermeer, a Catholic, sought to infuse his work with religious and spiritual significance. St. Ignatius of Loyola instructed the faithful to examine their conscience and weigh their sins as if facing Judgment Day. Only such deliberation could lead to virtuous choices along the path of life. The contrast between the valuable objects on the table, the Last Judgment, and the scales, symbols of the judgment itself, are intended to remind the viewer of the importance of resisting the temptation of earthly riches and living moderately in order to obtain salvation. The calmness of the young woman's features indicates that she is capable of living according to these principles. 
The transition between areas of light and shade and the rhythm established by the colors that were utilized contribute to the refinement of the scene. The woman's blue jacket echoes the piece of material on the table, while the color of the curtain on the left reverberates in the ochre tones on the table, the orange and yellow of the woman's stomach, and in the verticals of the picture frame on the far wall. The hand holding the balance occupies a position directly in front of the frame's dark corner, while the scales are set off against the bare plaster wall. The young woman's focused expression and the strict geometry of the composition, which alternates the horizontal and vertical lines with the diagonal created by the light entering from the window, are other elements which contribute to the sophistication of this painting. Young Woman with a Lute, also known as Woman with a Lute and Woman with a Lute near a window, depicts a young woman wearing a fur trimmed jacket and large pearl earrings, tuning her lute as she eagerly looks out the window, presumably expecting a male visitor, or has the male visitor just left. A musical duet in courtship is suggested by the viola da gamba on the floor in the foreground and by the flow of songbooks across the tabletop and onto the floor, according to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The placement of the chair in the foreground also suggests the expectation of male companionship. The tuning of a lute was recognized by contemporary viewers as a symbol of the virtue of temperance. The painting has muted tones, reflecting a shift in that direction by Vermeer in the mid to late 1660s. At this time, Vermeer began using shadows and soft contours to further bring about an atmosphere of intimacy. The impression of spatial recession and atmosphere is somewhat diminished by darkening with age of the objects in the foreground and by abrasion of the paint surface, mostly in the same area, according to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Wealthy young people in the Dutch Republic studied music as part of their education and amateur concerts provided a welcome opportunity for flirtation. The map of Europe in the background reflects the decoration of Dutch homes at the time, a sign of pride in the nation's preeminence in navigation and cartography. However, the map of Europe, filled with sailing ships, may be a subtle suggestion that her weight and the duet itself may be somewhat delayed. The light falling into the room through the panes of leaded glass picks out the glint of pearls at the woman's ear and throat, as well as the brass studs in the chair beside her. We focus on the musician as she is the bridge between the chair and the map. As with many Vermeer paintings, the main subject is illuminated by the light coming through a window. In Dutch cities, it was the street facing room that created the most light. Woman with a Pearl Necklace features a young Dutch woman, most likely a member of the upper class, dressing herself with two yellow ribbons, pearl earrings, and a pearl necklace. The woman is looking left toward a window's light source, dressed in a yellow fur trim coat. This type of fur coat was worn by wealthy Dutch women in the winter to keep them warm. In the middle 1660s, many Dutch interiors were filled with a variety of furs. These styles of furs were actually recorded in Vermeer's home in 1676. The yellow curtain serves as a counterbalance to the yellow of the girl's jacket. Together with the red ribbon in the girl's hair, the yellow tones are the only colorful parts of the painting. In art, pearls are symbols for purity, chastity, beauty, or love. In this painting, is the girl putting on her necklace, taking it off, or just staring in the mirror? A water basin, powder puff, a carved comb, and a silver jewelry box are on the table, showing that the woman is finishing her morning routine. This painting may suggest criticism towards a young upper-class woman's lack of occupation and her ample time for petty activities. The chair's position in the front of the painting contributes to the intimate atmosphere and creates a strong feeling of depth. The vase on the left is imported precious Chinese porcelain. The reflections on the vase indicate that light is coming from windows that the viewer cannot see. The brightly lit wall adds light to the painting, but given that it's a bare wall, does not take the attention away from the young woman. On the wall the woman is facing, Vermeer displays a framed mirror. The black frame is most likely made of ebony, which indicates wealth and status. Vermeer associated the sense of reflection to portray the woman with vanity or feminine power. According to the Essential Vermeer website, some historians believe this mirror may indicate a Dutch theme of vanitas or the reminder of death. The white walls occupy a large portion of the painting. This once again allows Vermeer to set a stage for his main subject, the young woman. Without any distraction on the wall behind her, 
the viewer can look more to the main figure's expression and actions. From the microscopic brush strokes, historians can find many thin layers of gray and white, which reveal Vermeer's attempt to create realism. Like Vermeer, during the Baroque period, many Dutch artists were striving for simple, clear, and natural realism. The woman's facial expression is also telling. As she seems to be finishing up her morning routine, the young woman is caught clasping her pearl necklace together. Her facial expression stares blankly and almost vainly ahead of herself, possibly out the window or into the black frame mirror. The woman retains a nice profile, yet blank look. This three-quarter pose was very common to the period and revealed the distinct quality of Dutch Baroque painting. Lastly, the deep blue tablecloth draped over the left side of the painting brings strong contrast to the work. Vermeer needed to create a contrast spot in order to maintain the geometric layout of the painting. Vermeer used a unique version of toning in which he used shades of browns and grays to line out his work. He most likely then used more structured colors like red, yellows, and blues as glazed tones to add texture to certain aspects of this painting. Some historians speculate that Vermeer used a camera obscura to create this artwork. If this is true, he could have been able to use perspective lighting to create the piece. Vermeer most likely used the expensive pigment lapis lazuli to make his works distinctive. Lapis lazuli was used in tiny amounts to create distinctive pigment for most of his works.